So I'm going to go ahead and fix that right now. Um, but I'm just really glad that you all are able to be here and I really appreciate you um, stepping up to serve your community. I, um, in case you know you don't know, I um, sat on my school board in the Creighton School District for eight years and I think it's really the heart of our democracy. So I'm so glad that you all stepped up. I'm gonna kind of wait for our participants to go ahead and trickle in. If I look off to the side, it's because I'm checking um, the Facebook in case comments come up, come up, although Lindsay always lets me know when there are um, comments. I know we're live on Facebook right now. So for everybody who's currently watching, give us a couple minutes here to be able to um, get everything situated and we'll get started with the programming here in just a minute. I am going to click on this and click on it again, and then I'm going to mute myself. Ah, there we go. So uh, people are still trickling in and we've got some viewers on Facebook, which is great. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started with the programming while we wait for the other candidate to join us today. So thanks everybody for joining us tonight for what is now our seventh candidate forum in this 2022 election cycle. Secular AZ is a 501c3 organization focused on protecting the constitution and the separation of church and state in Arizona for over a decade. I'm excited to be hosting this uh, seventh in our series of candidate forums for school board candidates here in Arizona. And we decided to begin hosting this type of event because our members care about the growing threat of white Christian nationalism in our state and country. And we're seeing how this political ideology is threatening our local school boards. And really our local school boards truly are the heart of our democracy. I know that we probably have some newcomers here. And if our mission is something that you care deeply about, we ask you to consider becoming a member of our organization, perhaps even becoming a monthly donor or volunteering for our various events throughout the state. Or better yet, you can do all three. Um, we have uh, opportunities that would guide you to the request to speak or RTS app that happens during the legislative session so that you can engage with your elected officials at the Arizona legislature when you sign up for our action alerts. We also, today I'm gonna go ahead and show the little shirt that I'm wearing. I'm gonna wait and see if it shows up on the camera, but if you believe in reading banned books, uh, we have these for sale and it helps our efforts to have programming like this. Um, so please uh, take a look at our website, secularaz.org. If you'd like to order those, we'd be happy to fulfill those orders. Um, so tonight we are going to be speaking with candidates for the Paradise Valley Unified School Board. And according to public records, there are 11 candidates running for three seats in Paradise Valley Unified School District. There are two four-year seats open and there is one two-year seat open. I wanna acknowledge the other candidates running in Paradise Valley uh, Unified School District. Cheryl Evanson and Sandra Christensen respectfully declined our invitation and we received no response from Lisa Ann Farr, Marcy Sarney, Fred, and I hope I'm saying his name right, Aylitz, uh, Eddie Jackson or Tyler Held or Healed. I'm not sure how you say his name either. So tonight we are going to be joined, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> well, we're definitely going to be joined by two candidates who are running for the two year seat, two of whom are here right now. And um, in a perfect world, we'll be joined by two candidates who are running for the four year seat. So uh, that means tonight we are joined by Carrie Baker and Eric Bistro, who are running for the uh, two-year seat. And then Susan Matura, who's currently here, and hopefully Tony Pantera, who confirmed that he was attending, uh, is running for the four-year seat. So just to kind of uh, do a little initial housekeeping to let you know how this is going to work, uh, we will allow candidates to introduce themselves with a three minute limit in alphabetical order. And then we will ask questions with the second person in that alphabetical order and then move on to the third and so on. And at around seven o'clock or so, we will ask any questions that are coming from the audience uh, or perhaps even on our Facebook. 
and then ask for closing statements around 7.45 or so. Um, again, we have some incredible programming coming up. In fact, we have another school board candidate forum coming up with uh, the Kyrene School District Governing Board candidates. I believe we have two confirmed candidates for that uh, board run. We also have a weekly update with a gentleman named Jared McDonald Evoy. Uh, he's the Arizona Mirror reporter and documentary filmmaker that discusses QAnon candidates in Arizona. And then this is one that I'm very excited about. I'll talk about it a little bit more at the end, but one that I'm really excited about is Hemant Meta, and I hope I'm saying his right, his name right as well. He's known as the friendly atheist. He discusses Christian hate preachers and their attacks on the LGBTQ community, non-theist women, and more. So I wanted to say that while we still have a lot of people here, and I will remind everybody at the end, um, but for now, we are going to start with, let's see, I, I know how to alphabetize because I used to be an English teacher. Uh, so <laughs> we have Carrie is going to go first. Oh, wait, yes, Carrie's going to go first. And then Eric will go second in alphabetical order. And then we will have Susan. Uh, if Tony uh, makes it tonight, then we will try to figure out a way to include him. Um, otherwise, it'll just be the three people who showed up tonight. And thank you all so much for stepping up. We appreciate you. We've seen what's going on at our local school boards and school districts. So for you to step up to an unpaid, um, board position that supports and promotes public education in your community is really commendable. So thank you. Aha, here we go. There's Tony. Hello, Tony. All right. So that's perfect, though, because he's going to be the last in order. And I know that you all have jobs and uh, busy lives just like the rest of us. So thanks again for taking time out of your schedule. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and allow our uh, Paradise Valley Unified School District board candidates to introduce themselves. And we are going to start with Carrie. So Ms. Baker, and if I turn my camera off, it's just because I don't wanna be a distraction and I wanna make sure that the internet speed is okay. And if I have my camera off, that's the deal. So what I will do too, if it looks like you're going over on time, I'll give you a little 10 second warning. You can also see it in the chat and then I'll just lower my hand to let you know and I'll pol polite you, politely ask you to kind of wrap it up. So Carrie, go ahead and introduce yourself to the folks here attending our webinar and our Facebook event. Okay. Um... I'm Carrie Baker. I was born and raised in Arizona. I have um, six kids. I'm currently a stay-at-home mom. Uh, four of my kids attend school in the uh, Paradise Valley School District. My youngest is going into first grade and my oldest school-age child is going into his senior year. I've had two graduate, one from Ironwood in the Peoria School District and one from Pinnacle High School. Um, I graduated from ASU with a dual degree in special ed and elementary ed. I taught uh, school for seven years in the Peoria School District and in the Dysart School District. Uh, six of those years were in self-contained special ed, uh, both autism and emotionally disabled. And one year I did teach regular ed first grade. Um, Prior to COVID, I did volunteer work in my kids' classrooms. During COVID, I was very much a full-time mom, making sure my kids got their schoolwork done. And now that my youngest is in full-time school, I decided it was time to um, do more work in the community and uh, decided to run for school board. So um, that's, that's me. That was probably a short introduction. No, we like it when people uh, go under time. <laughs> it allows us to get <laughs> questions in. So thank you for that, Carrie. And Eric, uh, Mr. Bistro, go ahead and introduce yourself to the people. Make sure, Eric, that you are unmuted. We still can't hear you, Eric. It will be on the bottom left-hand corner of your Zoom screen. There's a little microphone icon there. There you go. Um, now we can, can hear me it. now. Yes. Okay, we're, we're good. Um, my name is uh, Rick Bistro. And um, I was president of the Paradise Valley Unified School District Board 40 years ago. And so I guess the question is, why am I running for the school board again? 
The direct answer and the immediate answer is it arose out of a very contentious uh, 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 matter that occurred last November. Um, and it involved a controversy over a book called Have You Been Publicly Shamed? And it was a book that was assigned to um, uh, uh, AP Honors Kids at Horizon High School. And, um, and a number of parents, um, uh, and I believe outsiders as well, uh, became uh, very, very upset about that book. And it embroiled the school district in controversy. As a result of that controversy, uh, two teachers were suspended, they were reprimanded, and a very well-respected principal who had served the school district for 41 years was terminated in her job as principal at Horizon High School. It just so happened that that principal was a friend of my wife's, and my wife asked me to help her, and that's how I became involved in the issue. Uh, I was a private lawyer. I was in private practice for 40 years. I'm now semi-retired, and I did help her, and I immersed myself deeply into the controversy, and I think I have a pretty good understanding as to what happened. As a result of helping her uh, come to a resolution with the school district, a number of individuals, uh, particularly staff members, came to see me and they pleaded with me to run for the school board because they felt that they needed a strong independent voice on the school board. And I, uh, after some hesitation, uh, uh, I uh, ultimately agreed uh, that I would throw my head into the ring in order to provide that strong independent voice. Now, that is not the only reason I'm running. Uh, there are other reasons that I'm running as well. It is very clear that public education today is under broad attack by our state legislature and our governor. I have been an advocate of public education my entire life. Public education for generations has been the means by which people from all classes, from all races have a means to elevate themselves from poverty and make a, um, uh, make a change in their lives and have an opportunity to succeed. In addition, public education is the broad unifying force in our society. I am here, one of the reasons that I want to be on the board is so that I can be a strong voice for public education. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. So and it, it sounds to me you go by Rick. Is that correct? Most people call me Rick. Most people call you Rick. Am I, is it okay if I call you Rick? Yeah. Uh, my wife <laughs> only calls me Eric when she's mad at me. Well, then I certainly won't do that. Um, yeah, I was at that board meeting, actually. Uh, so thank you for that input. I appreciate it. All right. That means next we are going to go with Susan Matura. Uh, Susan, go ahead and introduce yourself to the attendees. Hi, uh, I'm Susan Matura, and I currently serve as the governing board president at Paradise Valley Unified School District, and I'm seeking re-election to the board. I've been involved in PV schools for the past 19 years, starting in the classroom, helping staple papers in the kindergarten classroom and, and cut out things for the teacher, uh, going on to serve on the PTO board at the elementary school and eventually serving as the PTO president for a few years uh, at the elementary school. I also served uh, on our United Parent Council. I be, uh, began uh, getting involved with them while I was on PTO uh, and served as a United Parent Council representative. And then I served as VP of membership and VP of programming. I also have spent time serving on district committees such as the Parent Student Handbook Committee and the Facilities Committee uh, as parent representatives. Uh, on behalf of uh, United Parent Council. And this past year, I even assisted in some classrooms to help with our teacher and staff shortage uh, that the district was experiencing. I was elected to the board in uh, 2018 and I am currently the board president. Uh, for my background, I grew up in Massachusetts. I went to Carleton College in Minnesota. I spent a few years in Indiana and then moved to Scottsdale 23 years ago. 
I was a small business lender at a bank until I retired to become a full-time mom. My husband and I have three kids. We have one in college, one who uh, is at a private high school, and one who is at PV schools. I believe in school choice, and I know that parents make choices in education all the time to find what works best for their children and for their family. Most families choose public schools for their children, and this is why I spend my time volunteering and supporting Paradise Valley Unified School District. Students open enroll across our district, out of our district, into our district, and I'm proud that Paradise Valley Unified School District is a place for all students, and I want to keep working to ensure that every student has a place in our district. Thank you for that, Susan. And thank you for serving on your local school board. And again, to those of you who want to serve on your school board. So uh, finally, that will leave us with Tony. And Tony, I wanna make sure that I'm uh, saying your name right. Pantera, it sounds pretty self-explanatory. So if correct me if I'm wrong. That is correct, Pantera, which in Italian and Spanish means panther. Oh, well, there you go. I've been called a cougar before. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Tony, go ahead and introduce yourself to the people who are attending. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Tony Pantera. Um, I was born in Buffalo, New York, but my parents moved here in 1960. We moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. There I attended Hohokam Elementary School. I went to Saguaro High School, ended up going to Arizona State University, where I got my degrees, um, bachelor's and master's degree special education, elementary education, got my uh, gifted endorsement there. And I've uh, been taught in this district, the Paradise Valley Unified School District since 1978. I'm recently retired. I retired this year after 43 years continually in this district. Um, so I know a lot of the people, I know the procedures, I know how they've changed. I've been a, a major factor in, in a lot of those changes. I've served on bargaining teams. I've been on district committees. I have. Um, you know, always been involved either in the schools directly or even in my community with some of the civic organizations I belong to, scouting, things like that. I'm really uh, centered on, on the community. Um, I wanted to run because I love this district. I love teaching students. I love them learning. And I want to make sure that we build on the wonderful system we have here. You know, take the things that work and keep them working and the things that aren't working, let's improve them. Um, that's why I kind of got my hat into the ring here myself. That's why I get started. I want to give back to the community. It gave me so much. My children went to school here. My grandson went to school at Boulder Creek, right across the street from where I live. So um, yeah, I'm very much involved and I love to uh, help people and to uh, make, make this world better for everyone. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I also had the opportunity to serve on a school board where I'd formerly been a teacher. And I, I love when teachers step up and um, run for any kind of elected office. So again, you all have such amazing resumes. Thank you so much for all that you've done for your communities. And let's go ahead and dig right into this. So we're going to be starting with Rick first. Uh, then we will go to Susan, to Tony, and then back to Carrie's for this next question or for this first question, I guess I should say. So here we go. Oops, you'd think that I would have it ready to go. Um, so uh, you've done a great job of introducing yourselves. Um, what kind of programming and policies and or policies do you hope to bring to the district? So, uh, you know, we've heard about your diverse backgrounds. What kind of programming or policies do you hope to bring to the district? And we're gonna go ahead and start with Rick. Go ahead, Rick. And, and again, make sure you're unmuted, uh, Rick, yeah. There we go. There you go. Okay. Um, all my life, I have been about strong academics. And, and uh, one of the um, uh, things that I would uh, emphasize uh, when I become a member of the uh, Board of Education is uh, that very thing. Well, um, I've been talking to a, uh, I looked at the um, uh, recent scores of the Paradise Valley Unified School District with regard to language arts, the standardized tests that are given by the state. 
and 50% of our kids, of all of our kids, were not proficient in language arts. And I've been making inquiries about why that is so. And I have been told that our AP kids, our honor kids are doing great and they are lifting uh, various schools up in terms of performance, but that there are many, many kids in our school district that are not learning uh, basic education. Uh, uh, they're, not, they're not learning math. They're not learning uh, uh, things, uh, critical things about social studies. They're not learning language arts. So one of the things that I would focus on that I would shine a light on is how can we make improvements in all of these areas, not just for the honors kids, not just for the AP kids, but for all of our kids, for the, for the, for, for the average kid to make sure that when he uh, graduates from our high schools, that he is uh, literate, that he has a strong sense of math, he, he knows how to write a letter uh, and that they can be good functional citizens uh, and, and who can think critically. Sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, thank you for that answer, Rick. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and go to Susan next. Same question to you. What kind of programming or policies would you like to bring to Paradise Valley Unified School District? Sure, uh, something that I would like to shine a light on and, and kind of bring something new, uh, new, importance on in our district is uh, looking at our foster care kids and McKinney Vento students uh, and and really seeing where we can be focusing on these students and, and things we can do to make their lives in our district a little bit easier. Um, each school, I'm not, uh, each school is working with these students and I know that the district and the each school principals are doing their best with these students, but I'd like to see an overall uh, district approach to working with students who are coming from a background right now where they're moving in and out of school districts, in and out of schools, not of their own volition, uh, and, and see what we can do and what policies we may need to revisit to uh, ensure that their time in our school district is the best and most meaningful and supportive environment that can be there for them. I wanna look into if there are policies in place to in, uh, make sure that if a student joins late in the year because of no fault of their own, uh, that there are exceptions made to them for joining any sort of clubs or activities uh, in the school district. And do we have any sort of funding that is directly uh, maintained to ensure that these students are able to attend prom and, and do things that will make their time in our district uh, better all around, which will being feeling supported in the district is going to ensure that these students are uh, able to learn and will excel in, in their studies. So I, I wanna kind of take a look at that this year. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And that will take us to Tony next. Uh, same question to you, Tony. What kind of programming or policies do you hope to bring to the district? Well, there's several things really. Um, probably my biggest one, because I know we have um, data-driven instruction in all our schools, and we have been making progress in test scores. Um, it's not where we want it, of course, but it's, it's getting there. And uh, I've seen a lot of change in our district from 1978 to now, we hardly had any Title I schools. Now we have a lot of Title I schools. So it's making those adjustments that are necessary. One thing I think that would help though, and I'm really into is um, community schools. You know, doing more at our schools beyond when the kids are there, you know, after school and before school, not just for the kids, but for the parents in that community, uh, making the, the school a hub for that neighborhood. I remember as a kid, that's where I would go for Cub Scouts. That's where I go for Little League. Um, that some schools have, uh, it's possible to get maybe some baseline legal help or some clinic kind of things. Basically, what does that community need? How can we make it happen at a school in some way to make it so that is a, fub, a hub, you know, tying the whole community together? I'm really into that. I also would like to do a lot of things with um, technology in our, in our schools, make them more efficient with our energy. Um, I know we've got solar panels, but I'd like to do more. One simple thing, I, I think, maybe I haven't tried it, so maybe it's not so simple, is to get electric vehicle charging stations at some of our schools, especially our high schools, 
So the kids are dri driving their cars to school, they can plug them in there and um, our parents showing up or staff. Uh, and those can actually generate funds for the school district if you have them there. That's a big uh, thing I really like to, to emphasize. Um, but the big thing for me really, community schools, what can we do to do things for more for our people in our neighborhoods in our district after schools? We make it a hub for the community. Maybe we can get more kids back into our schools from the charter schools. Another thing I've seen change you know, over the years is we, when I started, we are growing district, kids were coming, we're building new schools. Well, people are having less children and this district's older and they're moving away. And so we have less and less kids and they get these empty buildings. Well, that's pretty much what I want to say. So thank you. And I'm done. Great. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Well, you know what? I think a couple of you actually, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sw switch around here based on some of the conversations or some of the answers to the questions. Um, I heard a couple of you mention uh, testing and scores and things like that. So my question to you is what role should standardized testing play in driving school programming and policies? And I know you may have kind of answered this question a little bit, a couple of you, but um, what role should standardized testing play in driving school programming and policies? And so this uh, question, we're gonna go ahead and start with Susan. Amy, so I'm sorry, I didn't get to answer the last question. <gasps> oh my gosh. Carrie, Carrie, I am so sorry. See, okay. I feel like I always just be that. Anyway, Carrie, thank yeah. you for that. Way to use your voice. I am so sorry. Um, yes. So what kind of programming and policies would you like to bring, Ms. Baker? I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, there are actually two. Um, there are big reasons I'm even running for school board. The first one is I would really like to get... Um, a good LGBTQ plus policy in our student handbook. Some schools do a great job with this and others not so much. So I would really love to see some sort of policy across the whole district that um, protects uh, really our trans students, but also the whole community. I'd love to see um, the policy include bathrooms and pronouns and preferred names and um, things that help that population in our schools feel safe so that they can also learn to the best of their ability. Um, the other thing I would really love in this district is to have a better um, inclusion program for our special needs kids. We have a lot, a lot of um, self-contained classrooms in our district, and I would love to see a comprehensive um, program where we can get more of those kids mainstreamed into the classroom with their peers. So they have that, um, the peer models, the peer support, they have the same access to friends and activities and everything else to just have the same kind of school experience that they can and be with their peers as much as possible. And that includes, um, you know, teacher trainings. Inclusion can be really hard. And if teachers aren't uh, trained for it and if there's not a policy in place or a program in place for it, um, it's easier just to keep those kids in their self-contained classrooms. I know that as a special ed teacher. And so um, that's that's the other thing I would really like to see in our district is us do a better job overall with the uh, inclusion of our special ed kids. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> and thank you to, I don't, I couldn't see who put it in the Q&A to remind me, hey, you skipped Carrie. So uh, keep me on my P's and Q's because I do my best. So um, but going back now to the, the next question, what role does standardized testing, should standardized testing play uh, when it comes to driving school programming and policies? And again, we are going to be going with Susan this time, and I promise I will not forget to ask everybody this question. Sure. Um, so, it's unfortunate that our standardized testing has kind of been the end all be all uh, when it comes to down at the state house. And when it looks sometimes at some funding is based on that, our school uh, school grading system on how schools are graded within uh, districts is based on a single test score from a single, a single day, basically looking at how students are performing. And I think it puts a lot of stress on the students and on the teachers to perform and teach to the test, which is unfortunate. 
Um, of course, we want to see growth in our students, and we have assessments that are done uh, daily throughout the district, and we have even have standard assessments that are going across grade levels, across uh, curriculums, so that uh, teachers can make sure that the curriculum they're using, no matter which school they're at, they can be testing on the same things and see how their math class is doing compared to other math classes across the district. Um, so I think it's unfortunate that so much stress is placed on a standardized test for and that the state uses that for so much. When I, I wish that assessments were used more directly to ensure that students are growing daily uh, in their classrooms and that we would use data like that to build programming and uh, really focus in on students that need uh, tiered instruction uh, so that they can get assistance where needed and, and really focusing on the growth of each child and not so much teaching to the test and, and stressing uh, each April, each spring uh, about where that test will bring us. Great, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, next uh, person to answer the same question about what role should standardized testing play in uh, policy and programming to Tony, Mr. Pantera. Well, thank you. I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Su uh, Susan said, because we're stuck with it. It's something that's imposed on us by the legislature. And, and so, of course, it has to be part of our programming. I remember back in when I started, um, the district had its own scope and sequence. We had our own test to, to measure student growth, and we used them. And we took the results of those uh, test results, and we, we, we modified curriculum. Unfortunately, now it's um, because money's attached to it. Uh, the emphasis is... Um, been intensified. And I agree with Susan about the uh, feeling of teachers and, and students and the pressure that is happening because of it. I like the data-driven instruction we're doing now where people are actually looking all the time at the data. They're giving little mini tests in between and, and using that to uh, adjust their curriculum. But going beyond that, how are, we, how are we dealing with all the different populations we have? Does this student, you gotta look at the whole child. Do they feel safe in their environment, okay? Physically and emotionally. Uh, it's hard to focus on a standardized test when you're not worried about if you're gonna eat today or if some bully's gonna pick on you because you, of, of uh, how you identify yourself. How are we taking care of the whole child? And programs that don't deal with that as well as the state testing uh, data-driven instructions are, are gonna fall short because you can't do well unless you uh, feel well. So I'd like to see those kind of programs increase and. Um, I'm glad we have some of the social emotional instruction we have going on in schools now to help these kids. Uh, yeah, that's all I gotta say on that. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I welcome. appreciate it, yeah. Um, okay, now we're going to go back to Carrie, Ms. Baker, same question to you. What role should standardized testing play in programming and policies? Um, so high stakes tests are a moment, they're a snapshot. Uh, most students will perform well, but you're gonna have your population who didn't eat breakfast that morning or a child who didn't sleep because their parents were fighting the night before. And those kids are not gonna to perform to their best ability on the testing day. And if we're placing so much emphasis on that one test, um, I mean, we have to take into our account the poor test takers, the kids with so much anxiety, they can't even get out all the information that they know on the test that particular day. Um, not to mention the special ed students who might have been reading at a first grade level, but they're in eighth grade and they have to take that test at the eighth grade level. I know when I was a teacher, my classroom turned into a war zone during those testing days. I mean, we didn't get any testing done really, but my scores as a teacher and my pay were based on that. So I think um, in light of that, uh, the high stakes test should just be one piece of a whole toolkit on what we use to drive programming and policy and academics. There's so many other more valuable and accurate ways to assess teachers, to assess um, students, uh, that again, the high stakes test should just be one part of it. There are too much, there's too much emphasis placed on these tests when research shows that it is not the best measure of how teachers, students, or schools are performing. And it places really an undue stress on so many of these kids. I mean, my own 
fifth grader couldn't sleep the night before because he was so concerned about his own score on the high stakes test. So, I mean, I understand they're here to stay, but I just think it should be one part of a whole toolkit of assessments used to drive us uh, schools. Thank you. Thank you. Came in just in time. Um, all right. So this means that Eric, uh, sorry, Rick is, I don't want to I don't want you to be in trouble. You're not in trouble. Um, so Rick, please go ahead and answer the same question. Sure, thank you. Um, I agree that, um, you know, I agree with what uh, Gary said that, uh, you know, tests are just uh, one element of uh, making evaluations with regard to a student or a teacher or a, a program. But on, the, uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, tests, um, I think are an important tool for some degree of accountability. And, I, and, 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 and you need to have tests to have some, uh, uh, to, to ensure some level of uh, measurement. Tests um, uh, can, to, to a certain degree, when you, when you, when you uh, put together a, a test, um, uh, to, to an extent, it can shape a curriculum. And, uh, and it can drive instruction. So, so I do believe that uh, tests are an important tool uh, that should uh, be uh, utilized. Now, there's also a danger of over-testing. You know, uh, uh, you know we, we shouldn't be subjecting uh, 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 kids and, and uh, teachers to uh, constant testing so as to take away from instruction. Further, tests are no substitute for critical thinking. So there's a danger in terms of teaching to a test. We want kids to broadly learn a subject and we simply shouldn't be teaching uh, kids to take a test and get appropriate answers so that they're simply robots and uh, not uh, thinking. Um, I also agree that high stakes tests uh, where by a student advances or doesn't advance based on a particular test is a wrong concept. Many, many years ago, um, I was uh, deeply involved in the lawsuit involving English language learner programs. And one of the criticisms of the state program is that an ELL student could not advance unless they passed at the end of the year, a high stakes test. So say the Minimum score was Rick, seventy. I have to I have to interrupt you just for the sake of fairness, but I, I I'm I'm very interested in your answer. So if there's a point at some point where you can work that in, I would I would love to hear it. But I want to be fair to the rest of the candidates here and give everybody equal time. So um, that means that we're going to go ahead and move on to the next question. And I also heard uh, some conversation. I heard a little bit of talk about. LGBTQ policies, uh, social emotional learning, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I want to uh, go ahead and ask folks, uh, and we're going to this time start with Tony. Um, so do you support programming that includes things like uh, social emotional learning, for students um, or and or, and this might be a complicated question, but also diversity, equity, and inclusion training for teachers. These have somehow, I mean, I hear social emotional learning and I think that's a good thing. We want our kids to not only be literate when it comes to their, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, we want them to be competent. There was, I remember some, I think it was Pepsi corporation that, um, you know, talked about how they would have these stellar candidates applying for positions uh, who checked all the boxes on their CVs. Uh, but when it came to the interview, they lacked that kind of social emotional ability to connect with other people and how there's um, a deficit when it comes to folks having those qualities. So because I heard those things talked about, and again, like I said, we're going to start with Mr. Pantera. What role, um, where, where's my question? I got this, everything's fine. <laughs> Do you support programming that includes uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, inclusion training for teachers and SEL for students? Go ahead, Mr. Pantera. Well, thank you, I absolutely do. I, it's always been necessary. I mean, 
we've had counselors in high schools for decades and decades, right? To help people understand not only what they're to do with their career, but understand themselves. Uh, we have students, many more students now in our district that come from um, places that don't, English is not their first language. Uh, we have students now who are feel comfortable being who they really are and say, okay, well, maybe I'm transgender or maybe I'm gay or, or all these things that people can be. Um, they have feelings, okay? And, and this is gonna impact everything in their classroom. COVID has made it really difficult because we have so, many, so much time with um, online instruction, unfortunately, that we've had kids come to the schools that um, don't even have the basic understanding how to get along with each other. Some kindergartens, first graders, that's the only school they knew for a couple of years was online schooling without other students around them. So I absolutely support this. Our, back when I was a kid, maybe we'd, I didn't need as much of that because I wasn't aware of what was going on everywhere in the world. Social media, TV, and that is so much more prevalent. St children are much more aware of like every shooting that happens everywhere in the country, of wars places, of uh, things, that, protests that are happening. They see it happening. They say, hey, I'm a kid. Somebody might come into my school and want to shoot it up. Um, so they need more than I maybe needed because I, duh, I was just unaware. They are aware. They understand what's going on, and we need to help them with those feelings so they don't become a shooter or they don't become withdrawn and suicidal so they don't um, can perform on better on every test so they can grow in a way that they can interact with other people and, and get the jobs they need and work with the people once they have those jobs. I extremely, um, oh, and our district does have these kind of uh, programs. We do have training for teachers. I myself took some restorative justice uh, uh, programs. Uh, there's other things that, that teachers are exposed to in workshops and professional development. So it's there and I want to make sure we have more of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So same question now, and we are going to go to Ms. Baker. Carrie, uh, same question to you. The idea of social emotional learning and diversity, equity, and inclusion training for teachers. What, a, what is your stance? Do you support that? Yeah, I absolutely support both those things. I really agree with a lot of what Tony said. Our kids just came out of um, unprecedented times. You know, we were just in two years of a pandemic and a lot of those kids don't have the tools that they need to get along with their peers, to um, cope with their emotions. I'm a huge believer in teaching our kids coping skills, um, self-regulation, all of those pieces that help them with their interpersonal skills, with calming themselves down, with dealing with um, anxiety, whether it's just typical kid anxiety or anxiety, uh, all of these pieces help our students perform better in school. They help them get along with their peers. They help them understand other peers. Um, and the same with the teachers, as far as the training goes, um, there's, we have such a diverse population in our district. And the more the teachers can understand the backgrounds of their students, where their students are coming from and how to handle those types of students in their classroom and really relate to them uh, also helps those students do better in school, perform better, and again, have those better relationships that um, they might not have, have had if those uh, pieces of their mental health or their behaviors were just ignored. I think it helps with discipline. I think it helps with bullying. Um, I think it helps with all of those kinds of things. So yeah, I definitely agree. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are going to go to Rick. Same question to you, social emotional learning uh, curriculum for children and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion for the uh, adults on the campuses. And make sure that you're unmuted again, Rick. You're gonna get this at some point, I believe in you. I'm not fully familiar with the uh, programs in the Paradise Valley Unified School District, but I certainly would be in favor of uh, programs uh, that uh, assist uh, children um, uh, to uh, be more effective in the classroom, that assist uh, children to be respectful of one another, um, to uh, be respectful of diversity and uh, differences. Um, um, uh, many years ago, when I was on the executive committee of the Anti-Defamation League, um, uh, we uh, sponsored and put on statewide uh, programs to reduce uh, prejudice in the uh, schools. They were attended by uh, teachers, hundreds and hundreds of teachers 
throughout the state of Arizona. So to the extent that these kinds of uh, programs advance learning and, and, the, and the, there's a, a, a correlation between these programs and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and improvements in instruction and improvements in learning, I'm all for them. Great, thank you so much. All right, let's go on to the next question, right? Yes? Oh, no, and still me. Son Susan. of a gun. Yes, you're absolutely right. Okay, <laughs> Susan C., thank you for keeping me in check. Same sure. question goes to you. Of course. Um, yes, I'm very supportive of uh, the diversity uh, inclusion for teachers and, and SEL programs for our students. I think this is a, a piece of school that is, uh, it's definitely needed. Uh, for all, all students and staff and uh, teachers can't teach if the students are not uh, engaged in the classroom and are, and are not behaving in the classroom. And if there are bullying issues or uh, students are not uh, learning how to properly communicate with one another or how to behave in a classroom, the teacher cannot teach a math lesson in that environment. And in order for the teacher to be able to teach and the students to be able to learn, the, these are definitely skills that our students need. Uh, so I, I think it's an important skills that we are able to give our students. Uh, all of our students should feel safe in, in, in the school and, and they should feel understood and, and feel like they are a part of their classroom, a part of their school, a part of the district. And it, uh, so teachers being aware of where students are coming from and that not every student is, had breakfast that morning, not every student at any school, even in the non-title schools, you're going to have students that didn't have a good morning for any reason. And to have teachers just be aware to look out for things and uh, to treat students in a way to make them feel heard and valued and to have the students valuing one another and be able to be ready to learn. We need to, we need to put programs in place that make our students ready to learn when they come to school. And so whatever it takes to get them to that place, we, we need to put those programs there. And uh, I definitely support those programs. So thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I again, I'm jumping around on my little script that I have here based on some of the things that you talked about. I heard you talk about the, I, I can't imagine as a middle schooler myself having access to the kind of information that our kids have, right? Like um, we cannot, uh, there's no sticking our head into the sand like an ostrich at this point. And for, for our kids, especially, this is, you know, the millennial generation, Gen Z, Zoomers, whatever they're being called, it changes minute by minute, but they are connected all the time. And unfortunately, recently, we have seen, um, well, we saw the recent events in Uvalde, Texas. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the question, what do you think needs to be done with regards to stopping school shootings and what role can school boards play to keep kids and staff safe so i'll, I'll repeat it again um, this time we're going to be starting with miss baker um, so given the recent events in uvalde and buffalo and i mean just you name it uh, it's happening everywhere what do you think needs to be done with regards to stopping school shootings and what role can school boards play to keep our kids and our staff safe so carrie you're going to go ahead and go first with this question okay um so i am a gun sense candidate for moms demand action I uh, um, met with them and we discussed, you know, things that the school board can actually bring into the schools. And one of the things we talked about is they have a program that they will bring into your district. It's called Be Smart and SMART is an acronym. Um, so, excuse me, I don't wanna forget the right wording that they gave me, but um, the S is to secure your guns. The M is to model model responsible behaviors around guns. The A is to ask about unsecured guns in the home. So if your children are going on a, on a play date to someone else's home, you know, it would be smart to ask if their guns are kept locked up, if there are any guns in the home. The R is to recognize um, the role of guns play in suicide. And the T is to uh, tell your peers to be smart around guns. And um, so I just think 
we as school board members have an obligation to educate the community as best we can and to bring in programs that help keep our kids and families as educated as they can around gun safety. Uh, the other piece of this is the SEL classes and counselors at schools to maybe catch kids who might be thinking about doing something like this or kids who are struggling at home or to make even kids feel safe if they've heard someone talk about bringing a gun to school or something. And I, I also am a proponent of any sort of sensible gun laws, background checks, mental health checks, um, the red flag laws. So anything we can do to keep our community as safe and as informed as possible, I think we need to do it. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Rick, uh, make sure you unmute yourself. And uh, the same question goes to you as a school board member, you know, uh, sometimes our hands are tied by the legislature or, uh, you know, by the, the federal, the congressional decisions that are made. But what do you think needs to be done with regards to stopping school shootings and what role can you play as a school board member to keep kids and staff safe? I think you mean congressional decisions that are not made. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I guess there are a number of things that can be done, but there's no panacea for sure. I mean, at Uvalde, you had the security uh, forces right there, and that didn't prevent a, a mass shooting. But I guess one thing that you could do is you could work with professionals, with our police, with uh, other security uh, individuals, and do an inventory at each one of our schools and make sure that the schools are, are hardened to the extent uh, that they provide some measure of safety. Now you need to be cautious in doing that because you certainly don't want the uh, schools to take on the uh, appearances of a, a penitentiary. Um, uh, I also agree with uh, something that uh, Carrie had to say that we need to be on the alert uh, with regard to kids who may have emotional issues and, um, uh, and uh, students need to be encouraged that if they hear of something that's not right about one kid or another kid, they see something that's uh, posted on the internet uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, we need to encourage uh, people to report these things to the uh, principal so that uh, uh, those uh, children can get help and there could be some element of uh, intercession. Um, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the broader analysis, um, these shootings are going to continue we, we, we've had one mass shooting after another, after another, and, and that is simply going to continue, unfortunately, in our society until uh, we uh, enact uh, laws so that uh, some 18 year old kid uh, can't lawfully go into a gun store, purchase an AK-47, and then go to the school and wipe out a bunch of kids. Thank you for that. Um, and that means that we are going to be going to Susan. Same question to you as a school board member. Um, how do you plan on keeping kids and staff safe? Um, this is really such a sad reality where we are nowadays and, and it's a sad reminder how, how many of these things continue to happen. Um, I know in our district, we do have our district emergency response team, um, DIRT, and they are, um, I feel confident that they look every time there is an issue somewhere else, they, they bring that information back to the committee and, and look at how something like that would work, would, um, would have lined up in, in our in our district um, and tabletop exercises and, and, and going through procedures and, and fine tuning constantly uh, what our processes are in the district. And I think that's really important. Uh, it's something that I, I think that PV schools is a leader in and will continue to, to be. Um, we have gates around our schools. Um, I remember being so sad when those all went up, but it is, it's our reality. Um, and so having the single point of entry uh, is really important. And something we saw and learned from Uvalde is making sure that someone is checking those, uh, those safety measures and ensuring that doors are 
locking properly and that the gates are locking properly and that uh, that's something as a district that we can control those sorts of things as best as we can is to continue to monitor those and and make sure that any fixes are done immediately. Um, those aren't things that can can wait. Um, I think we have school resource officers in a lot of our schools and the role that they play in in making and building relationships with our students has been really important. They are teaching our students uh, their friendly face on the campus. It's someone that students can feel comfortable going to. And I think having adults, safe adults on campus counselors uh, that are, are watching out and, and teachers that students trust and feel that if they see something, they have someone to say something to. And, and I think that's our best defense uh, is providing uh, students with uh, adults that care and that they feel comfortable bringing things to and bringing information to so we can act on it. Great. Thank you, Susan, for your answer. Um, and that means that Tony, oops, my earbud fell out. Uh, Tony, and the, you're the you're the last one to answer on this one. So I know who to go to next, I'm pretty sure. So Tony, go ahead. Same question to you. Yes, well, uh, really, all, everyone has spoken so far has touched on one aspect or another of, of things I believe in the physical security. I've seen our buildings change dramatically since I started teaching with the uh, reinforced doors and bulletproof glass kind of things. Um, and the protocols, the lockdown drills that we do, the procedures. And as a school board, we have to make sure people are held accountable for making sure those protocols are followed and they're checked constantly. Um, I agree with the training of, of students about what to look for, you know, what to look for in danger as far as that, uh, what Carrie mentioned with the um, the smart, the whole smart aspect of things. Um, but the thing that I wanna to touch on maybe deeper is that whole emotional part. You know, my students sometimes reach out to me after I've been, you know, after I see them when they're adults and they don't talk to me about the tests that they took when they were students. They don't talk to me about, you know, the lockdown drills. They talk to me about how they felt, the great projects we did, the uh, uh, project-based instruction kind of things, the way they felt liked and accepted by me and by uh, and how I fostered that in the classroom. See, if we do more of that, we have to do all the other things too, but making those students feel liked, accepted, and safe to say what they wanna say without being ridiculed or made to feel weird, then maybe any feelings that might build up on them in them to make them wanna go out and commit these atrocities might not happen. Okay, you get it out and, and you get a, this dialogue going. Um, you know, we all carry for each other and are no and, and are taking care of each other will make the likelihood even less uh, uh, happen that someone's going to uh, commit one of these acts in their own school. All the other things, of course, too, but really, let's uh, the best preventive medicine is to make sure no one wants to go out in, into a school and shoot it up. Yes, I'm done. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, okay, so at this point, I do want to remind folks that if you would like to ask questions of these wonderful candidates, then by all means, if you're in the webinar, then you can post the questions in the Q&A. If you're on Facebook, we will do our best to monitor those questions and make sure they all get answered. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and continue with for what many of our members is probably the most important question, uh, as we are focused on the separation of church and state and the establishment clause. So that question to you all is what role, if any, should religion play in our public schools? So again, the question is what role, if any, should religion play in our public schools? And then we are going to be going to Rick first. So Rick, go ahead, take it away. And unmute yourself. <laughs> I'm doing that now. Um, it's, it's certainly a complicated area. And um, uh, I think it's fairly clear that the uh, state uh, cannot uh, 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 mandate religion, uh, can't uh, coerce a religion in its official capacity. Um, uh, it can't promote religion. Um, uh, and it needs to uh, remain neutral with regard to religion. Um, so at the same time, 
the establishment clause of the constitution then conflicts with the free exercise clause. So at the same time that the that schools should not and cannot uh, promote religion, um, uh, individuals in their individual capacity have a right to freely exercise their religion. So it's a very, very uh, complicated area. Uh, I do believe that schools uh, should have the right to teach about religion. They can certainly, you know, um, you know I remember when I was a, a teenager, uh, you know, I had to compare a, a passage from Ecclesiastes with a, a passage from, uh, and I can't remember who the uh, uh, Greek author was, but I had, I had to compare and contrast. That is certainly uh, permissible. Certainly some of the most beautiful uh, passages ever written uh, you know, can be found in the Bible. And as a literary example, it, that can be uh, taught. Um, uh, uh, and just in terms of uh, history, um, uh, uh, history teachers can teach about the Great Awakening in the 1700s uh, when, uh, uh, when the Great Awakening broke down um, uh, uh, the, the uh, standard uh, the, the standard types of religion that was being practiced at the uh, time. Uh, you can teach about uh, how religion has been used as a uh, cudgel in one way or the other. I but, apologize. I think that we reached time and I it was my fault because I, I was checking the messages on Facebook. So my apologies. I was, I was waiting for your hands to go up. I'm so sorry. Yes, thank you so much. And um, all right, so that means that next we have Susan. What role, if any, should religion play in our public schools, Susan? Um, I believe in the separation of church and state. And so I don't believe that religion um, belongs in our public school beyond uh, where you might see it in historical accounts. Uh, and you'll see comparative religions and, and things like that in, in some of our history classes and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but beyond that, I don't think that religion itself belongs in our public schools. Uh, we're a nation and a district of many faiths. Uh, and the school district should not be in a position to put one religion above another. Public school should be a place for all students, no matter their faith, their beliefs. And uh, we want to make sure that it remains a welcoming place for all students, no matter their background, beliefs, faith, uh, where they are uh, within their families and, and their, they, they have that uh, time with their families and faith communities, but school should be a time for school. Uh, each and every student and staff member should feel welcome in our school district and religion shouldn't be uh, something that kind of divides kids and, and teachers and, and staff members in our district. Thank you so much, Susan. Same question goes to you, Tony. What role, if any, should religion play in our public schools? Well, I know it played uh, a, a big role every day that I taught in the 43 years I taught in, in my instruction because during our moment of silence, I prayed. I prayed for myself that I would do a good job with my students, and I prayed for my students that they'd be happy and healthy and learn well. But I did that silently. I did that on my own. So personally, religion was always part of my experience in teaching. Having said that, I agree with all the other speakers that there are many faiths in our in our school. We should, if a student comes to me and they have something they want to do that's faith based or not faith based, it's their goal. It's their it's their um, philosophy. I'm going to try and give them the tools they need to follow it the best they can without any discrimination. Uh, it should not be um, a part of the curriculum per se, unless it's uh, like what was mentioned before. Um, we do need to keep students from harassing each other about their faith, you know, putting each other down because you're a Muslim or you're, you're a Buddhist or whatever it might be. We can't let that happen. Um, and uh, going beyond that, there's one other thing I was going to say, and I think I forgot it already. Yeah, we, we can't discriminate. Um, let them be who they are, okay? Uh, if they need to bring in their own resources and want to be themselves and as part of a cultural exchange, by getting to know each other, we can learn to tolerate each other at least and get along much better uh, and, and have more of a safer environment that way. But as far as a, a prescribed thing, no. Oh, I know. Uh, teachers shouldn't be leading uh, prayers. Um, I, I, I don't think it should be done because you're the leader of the classroom. 
kids want to please the teacher, especially at elementary le level. So if I'm leading a prayer, you know, it might be legal in some place to do so. I shouldn't do it um, because they might just be feel that pressure because they want to please me. And I think that's wrong. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, and that is going to take us back to Carrie, Ms. Baker. Same question goes to you. What role, if any, should religion play in our public schools? So like the other candidates, I am a firm believer of the separation of church and state. It is what our country was founded on. Um, when I hear people talk about prayer and religion in schools, most of the time they're talking about one religion. They don't want someone standing up and leading a Muslim prayer. They don't want you to be celebrating Passover. They don't want you to be leading something in Hinduism. It's Christianity. And we have too many students from diverse backgrounds. We have too many teachers from diverse backgrounds to pick the one religion that some people want in schools. Um, and like Tony said, you, the teacher holds the place of power in the classroom. If you have a teacher leading a Christian prayer in your classroom, that is alienating to the other kids who might be from diverse backgrounds. Or like he said, they might then want to please their teacher by also saying a prayer, which would go against the religion their parents um, have brought them up in. So I just feel like it needs to stay out of the classroom. Um, we need to focus on academics, not prayer, not religion. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, <clears throat> all right, I'm not seeing any questions coming in quite yet. Um, we do have a great comment though that I just wanna share with all of you. Those candidates who chose not to participate missed an opportunity to have their voices heard by voters. Nice forum tonight. Uh, so thank you for your participation. Uh, I appreciate all of you. Oh, look. Looks like we've got something coming up in the Q&A here. Um, okay, because this is a, a big issue for a lot of people. So let's go ahead and talk about it. As uncomfortable for some people as it may be, um, please address your stance on CRT. And so some people call this uh, critical race theory, which is a, you know, a study that happens usually in our uh, postgraduate education. Some people might refer to it as culturally responsive teaching. Uh, so uh, address your stance on CRT. And it looks like, if I'm, if I'm doing this right, that we are going to go to Susan first. So Susan, go ahead and answer that question. What is your stance on CRT? Sure. Um, this is something that really came out of uh, out of the blue, kind of, and has been uh, kind of uh, brought on in, in the past year. Is really just come out of nowhere, and uh, people believing that these are things that are happening in our district. Um, I can confidently say that there's not CRT being taught in the district. Uh, the concern is some people, um, again, put different different uh, definitions on, on what that might mean. Uh, but in general, I can assure you that our teachers are professionals. They're not there to uh, try to make kids feel bad about themselves. They are there to build up their students. That is, they put their lives into this profession, and uh, and they are there to teach our kids and help them learn and help them become critical thinkers. They're not trying to indoctrinate them to become like them because they, again, they they've spent their lives on this profession and, and want their students to come into their own. Um, if if a parent does feel that something is happening in the classroom that they don't think should be taught to their student, then they definitely should speak to the teacher and let them know their concerns uh, and go to the principal beyond that if they're not uh, receiving responses from the teacher. But to decide that uh, one item that a, a teacher might have uh, discussed on a day that might be misinterpreted, uh, and to decide that that's something and uh, indicative of something happening across the entire district and 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 that that must be something happening it, it is not helpful uh, as opposed to getting to the root of the concern and not generalizing uh, teachers are professionals we want to let them teach uh, and if parents have concerns they should be talking to the teachers 
Uh, okay, so same question. Uh, the the uh, question in the Q and A was address your stance on CRT, and we are going to be going to Tony next. Yes, uh, I'm going to piggyback again on what uh, Susan said. It's not part of our adopted curriculum here at PV Unified School District at all. I've taught here. I know. I, I'd see it if if it was there. And I think what people don't realize is that. The board approves curriculum. We don't create the curriculum. The curriculum is created through uh, committees. And those committees have teachers, administrators, and most importantly, parents. Parents are on all these committees, whether it be math adoption, social studies adoption, any of these adoptions and beyond that. Um, if it were to ever be considered, which I've never heard anyone saying it should be, um, it would have to go through some kind of committee and parents on that committee would have to say they want this thing really bad and the board should approve it. So um, I'm pretty sure it's not gonna happen, all right? This is enough that something's ever been brought up. No one's wanted to say it, it's not here now. And you understand, parents drive uh, the curriculum in many ways. We just approve what the community wants us to put in there. Thank you. Great, thank you for that answer. Uh, we will go next to Ms. Baker. Same question. What's your stance on CRT? So uh, like previously stated, CRT is a college level course. It is not in our schools. Um, it can't be in our schools because it's for adults who choose to learn it to learn. However, do I believe that uh, we need to be doing a better job of teaching actual history? I do. I think that if we are not teaching uh, truth-based history, we are doing our students a disservice. Um, those who do not learn about history are doomed to repeat it. And I, I very much think that's true. In Germany, they continue to teach about uh, the Nazis because they don't want that to happen again. And there are things that happen in our history that are not pleasant. And while we don't need to make our students feel guilty about it, they do need to know it is important to understand other people's experiences. It helps us to be more empathetic more sympathetic. It gives us um, a better understanding and tolerance of other cultures and other people and what they've gone through. And so I think when we deliver a whitewashed version of history, we're doing um, the community and our country a huge disservice. And so no, there is no CRT in our schools. I don't think it should be in our schools, but I do think we need to do a better job about teaching truth-based history. Thank you. Great, thank you, Carrie. Um, so Rick, we're gonna go to you, same question. What's your stance on CRT? I think that um, CRT for the most part is a huge diversion and, um, and I'm confident that uh, CRT, as I understand CRT, because it has different meaning to different people, is not being taught in the Paradise Valley Unified School District. This country was founded on the fundamental notion that we do not judge people based on their race, their religion, their nationality, um, uh, their social status. We judge people based on their achievements. We judge people based on their character. Um, and uh, that, is a, that is a foundational principle of the United States to the extent that um, uh, anything is being taught that deviates from that purpose, I would strongly oppose. At the very same time, I would echo what Kerry had to say. Um, we have a troubled history in this country. And uh, so on the one hand, we need to teach the purpose of the country. We need to uh, uh, imbue our kids with what the ideals of the country are all about. But at the very same time, we need to teach our students the means by which we have fallen quite short of those ideals. Great, thank you. And uh, I'm gonna, so uh, I'm, I apologize because uh, at times when we've had these candidate forums, sometimes people wanna ask questions to specific candidate members. And so I'm going to do my best to kind of paraphrase this uh, question that's coming from anonymous attendee. Um, and it mentions that uh, one of you all are friends with Tom Horn. Um, you know, you already mentioned it in the work that you've done in the past. 
Uh, and so, um, uh, I guess, you know, because I see it in my neighborhood too, there it is the season of political signs littering our corners on every major intersection. And it is true that Tom Horn signs specifically say no CRT in schools or anti CRT. And so I guess the question that I could probably ask is, would you all support, because we have a very important election happening in 2022, would you support a candidate for the very important position of um, superintendent of public instruction? Uh, would you support a candidate whose platform rests almost entirely, it seems, on an anti-CRT platform? So uh, I, I, let's 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 limit this. Uh, well, no, let's keep it two minutes because we still don't have a lot of questions coming up in the Q and A. Um, so, are you going to support a candidate for the superintendent of public instruction that supports an anti or that runs on an anti CRT platform? And you can make this as short or as lengthy as you want to. And I'm sorry, that means Tony, you're going to go first. Well, what a school board member feels about any candidate is irrelevant to our district, okay? Um, having said that, the kind of person I would look to to, to support for, um, since you're asking me, would be somebody who is um, pro-students, pro-teacher, um, wanted to get things done, uh, not take, doesn't want to use any kind of sensational uh, false news or a fragmented piece of news that's to, for sensationalism to get themselves elected. That's all I'm gonna say on that. Great, thank you so much, Tony. And that means that, uh, Carrie, same question to you. Would you support a candidate whose entire platform seems to be anti-CRT? No, I would not. Um, because it is continuing that false narrative of what's happening in our schools and it's not happening in our schools. Um, there is no CRT in our school. It is a piece of propaganda that um, a candidate would use to, um, to just get votes. I mean, it's not real. It's not based on anything that we're doing in our schools. I would love to know, I mean, maybe what else he supports or what else the candidate wants, not just one piece of sensational rhetoric that does not exist in our schools, especially as the superintendent of public instruction. That is such an important role for our schools, for our school districts. And we need someone who is running on real um, goals, real values, factual things that are happening in schools. Thank you. Thank you. So same questions going to you, Rick. I guess the... Uh question was directed at me. Um, uh, Tom Horn has been a partner and a friend of mine for uh, many years. I've known Tom for 50 years. And Tom is a brilliant man. Uh, he went to Harvard undergrad, graduated with the highest honors, and he went to Harvard Law School with the highest honors. I don't agree with everything that Tom Horn has to say and never uh, have fully agreed with him. But I will tell you that uh, uh, that I, when I was his uh, chief deputy at the office of the attorney general, he was one of the best administrators of the attorney general's office that you could possibly imagine. So he has tremendous skills. Um, now with regard to CRT, uh, I think uh, uh, it, is, it is largely a uh, myth, uh, uh, but I'm not going to say that it doesn't exist because uh, I'm very well aware of programs like the Common Understanding of CRT have in fact occurred. And there was a program down in the Tucson Unified School District in which there was a hearing before an independent judicial officer that said that that particular program was actuated by racism. So, um, uh, uh, and, and that was only about six or seven, eight years ago. Great, so same question now, I believe is going to go to Susan. Sure, uh, when I see something like that on a sign, I feel like it's a shortcut 
to uh, some feelings, some other feelings that that candidate might have. Um, and in my in my mind, it, it makes me feel like that person might not be as supportive of uh, teachers and educators and not trusting uh, that our teachers are there to as professionals and uh, are there to teach students and uh, and it gives me a feeling of uh, believing that there may be some uh, where they're going to talk about indoctrinating students and things like that. So that worries me uh, seeing that and I feel like it's a shortcut to kind of explain some other things. Uh, and so it would worry me that that person might not be as supportive of teachers as I would want a candidate to be. Thank you for that, Susan. It looks like we have another question, and this is an important one. I, I read recently that we are looking at uh, having a third of our classrooms right now um, that are devoid of highly qualified teachers. I saw on another social media platform, like some Facebook group or something like that, a parent who was super concerned that her child wasn't going to be able to access physics. I saw another uh, report today that in Tucson Unified School District, that they are looking, at Gabriel Trujillo, the superintendent of Tucson Unified, was talking about um, having virtual math teachers because they cannot get enough math teachers. Myself, my, my own daughter, she just graduated from ASU. She uh, graduated with honors, had the, the, the highest of accolades uh, from her professors and her mentor teacher where she student taught. And unfortunately, she's left the state because uh, she can, you know, she can um, make more money, have smaller class sizes, higher per pupil spending. We all know kind of what's going on in Arizona. And teacher retention is, Arizona is essentially ground zero for it because unfortunately, consistently, we land in the bottom three. So what, and this is from Hera, I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, she wants to know uh, what these candidates, what all of you all would do to retain our teachers. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it does look like Ms. Baker will be first on this question. So what is your plan as a school board member to um, hire and retain teachers to the Paradise Valley Unified School District? So, I mean, we know teachers need more pay. We know they need smaller class sizes. And um, I will do everything I can as a board member to help with teacher pay, to help with class sizes. But a lot of that is our legislature, which we know is not education friendly right now. Um, However, as a governing board member, I would um, enable, in order to retain teachers, I would um, uh, respect their bargaining agreement. I would vote in favor of that because teachers work too hard for us to not then support any terms they came to with the district. I would um, value and honor their planning time, um, their prep time, their lunch time, do anything I can to not have them hold their bladder for seven hours a day. Um, we need to uh, improve working conditions. Uh, we need to try to get substitutes in so they don't, they're not covering other classes. Um, anything that we can do as a district um, besides teacher paying classroom sizes that really supports and values our teacher is, is what I would do as a governing member to try and retain our teachers. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Rick, same question to you. And that question again is what would you do as a school board member to uh, retain our teachers? Well, I would echo certainly some of the things that, that Carrie had to say. We need to do everything in our power to ensure that they have adequate pay. Um, uh, I would do everything in my power to ensure that there were small classes, but I also would, uh, as a, a board member, I would do everything in my power to make the teachers out there feel that they're being supported. Uh, so, so when they're having encounters and issues with uh, discipline, for example, you know, I would make sure that teachers know that we have their back 
when they have confrontations with students. I would, I would ensure that teachers know that they have our back as a district, you know, when they have confrontations with, uh, with uh, very difficult uh, parents. So I think that's also a very, very important component of, uh, of uh, what the school district can do to uh, retain our teachers. Great, thanks. Same question is now going to go to uh, Susan. What would you do as a board member to retain teachers in the district? Sure, uh, this is always a huge concern and, and I, I get concerned every time I see teachers retiring and, and Tony retired on us this year. And uh, you know we, we need to replace those teachers as, as they're retiring and leaving and, and uh, too many teachers are leaving the profession. Uh, I think treating teachers as the professionals they are, uh, making them feel valued, feel a part of the process, feel trusted. These are all things that, that we can do uh, when we can't offer super high salaries because that's just not in, in the budget. Um, I'd love to be able to wave a magic wand and, and pay teachers what they are worth and, and that's just not happening right now. Uh, so we need to, to look to do things to make these teachers feel like Paradise Valley Unified School District is a good working place where they are valued, they are trusted, they are treated professionally, uh, that we value their time. We want them to be a, a part of discussions within the district, a part of decision-making. I, I think that's a huge part of it. Uh, making decisions from the top down uh, is not helpful uh, when you're not taking uh, the expertise it, uh, into account that we, we have that expertise out there and, and we like to use that, use that knowledge in, in making decisions. And so whatever we can do uh, to make teachers feel valued and, and a strong part of our district and trusted is uh, really something that I would be focusing on. Great, thank you so much. And uh, so now to Tony, same question to you. Well, yes, uh, 43 years I've been teaching. I used to teach, now I'm retired. But um, all those years, money and class size has always been an issue. But yet we still had teachers. Um, we've had the bargaining agreement, and that's been a really good in this district for recruiting people in here. These teachers see this, oh, they got this bona fide agreement that knows that they know the teachers are being listened to, at least by administration, and some kind of working framework that they can count on. Um, the thing, the biggest thing really to keep these teachers is and get them, that's getting them we can do, but keeping them is let's take some things off of their plates. Not one program after another that they have to learn and, and, and begin in their classroom over and over again, the latest flavor of curriculum or the method that's this year. Less staff meetings if we can get them. Okay, we need staff meetings, but how many do we really need? As a gifted specialist, I do my staff two staff meetings, one at each school, and then my gifted staff meeting. And that's just me, okay? Let's take things off their plate. Let's treat these teachers like professionals, not like villains. They've been villainized by the public because of our, our, our legislators. We should continue as a board to lobby the legislature for more funds. We should lobby them for laws that don't punish teachers by making them like say, write the curriculum for a whole year and publish it. That's, that's one thing that you can take off their plate. Let's uh, lobby the legislature. Let's take things off their plates. Let's treat them like the professionals because they are the most important part. They day to day, they are with those students. They're the ones making it happen. So that that's I think a great way to, to keep the teachers and retain them. Great, thank you all so much. Um, we have some very similar questions coming in. It sounds like you all in the Paradise Valley Unified School District have an m and um, uh, uh, measure that's going to be on the ballot for residents who live in that area. And for those of you who maybe are out there watching, um, what's, what's happened in Arizona is we have two different kinds of overrides is what they're called. There's a capital override that pays for the physical you know, property, fixing air conditioning or, or you know, the, the schools themselves. And um, then we have an m and uh, which accounts for, you know, teacher salary boosts and classified staff, which is also something that's been brought up. So I'm going to try to get to these questions. But essentially, the question here is that's coming from Melissa and an anonymous attendee um, is if the m the maintenance and operation budget override does not pass, 
how would you prioritize the allocation of remaining funding? What would you support cutting if cuts are necessary? Probably one of the most difficult decisions as a board member. Um, so, and, and so again, how do you prioritize the allocation of the remain, remaining funding? And what would you support cutting if those cuts are necessary? And um, let's see, it looks like, I think that Rick is going to be first on this one. So Rick, go ahead and answer that question about the M&O and what do, we, what do we consider cutting when we're already bare bones? Well, let's hope that that doesn't happen. I don't think uh, that a uh, override has uh, failed in the Paradise Valley uh, Unified School District for uh, roughly uh, 40 years. But what I would do uh, is that those uh, personnel that are closest to the uh, classroom, those are the ones that I would give priority to. So, so I, I would do my very utmost not to cut teachers. I would do my very uh, utmost uh, uh, not to uh, cut uh, uh, critical administrators. Uh, so uh, those individuals, those personnel that are closest to the classroom, those are the ones that we need to give our priority to. Great, thank you so much, uh, Rick. And that means that Susan, you are next. If it doesn't pass, uh, what would the what would the what would be on the chopping block, basically? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a real concern for us because uh, if the override does not pass this year, then there will be definite uh, definite loss of funding and that will mean that tough decisions need to be made. Uh, first and foremost, I uh, what I appreciate about our district is that there are always, uh, when big decisions like this are made, that uh, everyone is a part of the discussion, that, that this isn't a decision that will just be the governing board deciding you know, what stays and what goes, uh, that there's a lot of input that comes from parents and comes from administrators and comes from teachers uh, and, and hear what are the most important things in our district uh, to keep the district functioning. Um, I'm hoping that this does not come to pass. And, and again, like uh, Rick said, that keeping the structures in place that are closest to the student so the students feel the least amount of disruptions is always important. And while it may be easy for some people to say, you know, let's just cut at the administration level, it's not that easy. There are things that are happening at the administrative level that support teachers and students that are just not seen on a day-to-day -day basis. But when constantly curriculum changes are being made at the state level, there needs to be uh, someone who is reviewing that and deciding and, and looking at what changes need to be made to our curriculum so that each and every teacher doesn't have to go through the curriculum or each principal doesn't have to go through the curriculum to make that determination because there's no time for those people to do that. So having an administrator whose job it is to, to look at things like that, um, that's important because it keeps our teachers teaching. It, it keeps those uh, closest to the students, uh, you know, working with the kids. And so there's not an easy, just, you know, we'll just cut administration. And so I, where people might feel like that's an easy option. Uh, that's, there you go. We're gonna go ahead and call it time. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan. And next, we're going to go ahead and go to uh, Tony. Um, if it doesn't pass, what are you going to do? Well, I'll resign from the board because it's, it's going to be a, it would be a disaster. I'm just teasing, but it would be a disaster. Uh, it's a, it, it would affect everyone, especially our classifying support people. Okay, uh, we're also having trouble finding them as well and getting them to stay in our in our schools. But again, ag agreeing with Susan. This is something that would be spread out. No one area is gonna be hit by it. Uh, it's gonna be done, whatever cuts are made are gonna be from input from the whole district. Uh, we've had this happen before, uh, the last great recession where we had to make major cuts and we did the same thing. We had uh, groups report, they, they got together. Well, how can we do this? What can we do that? I remember as a gifted specialist, I was teaching full-time gifted at the school I was at. Well, they decided, well, we're gonna make you go between two different schools during that time you know so but it was decided per department per um curriculum area per school i mean 
everyone gave their input and a general overall plan was established to make these cuts as terrible as they, they were. Um, and, but really, let's get this thing passed. Let's not let that happen uh, because it would be a disaster. Yeah, in a district like uh, Paradise Valley, you have a lot of schools, so there's 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 a lot of money involved in that. Uh, yeah. Same question is going to go to uh, Carrie. Go ahead, Carrie. I mean, every time I hear this, I think, what else can they possibly cut? Where we're already bare bones. Where else are the cuts going to come from? Um, but I I agree with the other candidates. I think that it can't just come from one area. Like we can't just like cut art. As a board, as a district, we need input from all areas to, I think Tony said it, a little bits from each area. Um, because you can't just cut teacher salaries. I mean, that that's happened. And uh, I mean, when I was a teacher, I made less my second year teaching than I did for my first year teaching because they were just cutting our salaries all the time. You can't do that. Um, we don't have enough teachers. Um, and I just really feel like it has to be like a joint decision and we definitely can't cut, um, I think Rick said it, um, anything closest to the students, the staff that's closest to the students, the programming, if we can keep any of that art, music, band, all that stuff is what keeps our kids engaged and keeps our kids coming to school. And so, um, yeah. And we just can't let it come to that. I mean, we have to get out there and knock doors if we have to, to get this override to pass. We just have to. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, some of the hardest decisions that I ever had to make as a board member were during those community member meetings where we were literally, we had surveyed staff and students and parents and teachers and, you know, what do we need to put on the chopping block? Because Unfortunately, I got into education in 2008, possibly the worst time <laughs> to, to get into it. And I was on a pay freeze for the first four years that I was in education and very, very difficult conversation. So thank you all for your very thoughtful uh, answers. I'm hoping that we can maybe squeeze into more questions because there were a couple of things that came up. Though this one comes from an audience members, uh, a member and um, they point out that we are not just experiencing a teacher uh, shortage, which really isn't a shortage because we have over 50,000 teachers who have uh, you know, certificates, but they choose not to teach. We're also uh, experiencing a staff shortage. And for those of us who work in education, our classified staff members truly are the heart of our schools. They're the folks who live there and they they rely on us they they're the first person that you see on the school bus they're the person that serves us lunch they're the paraeducators who are in those assisted classrooms so this question is how do you recruit and retain these critical employees because they truly are the lifeblood of our public schools and looking at my notes this means that susan is going to go first so what are you going to do susan to you know, um, address the staff shortage problem that we're seeing, not just here in Maricopa County, but all throughout the state. Yes, this is a, a, a real concern. And every time I see a bus pull up, um, uh, they, there was just one at my daughter's field trip the other day. She was doing something in the summer and it was a PV bus driver there. And I went and I introduced myself and said, thank you for being a bus driver. And, uh, you know, thank you for serving the district because, it's so hard to keep people. And, uh, and he was actually really excited to be back with the students and, and serving our district. Uh, but the, the staff that we have loves our students so much and they are such an integral part of our district. And I can't say it enough, but whenever, whenever I see someone, uh, a staff member, I, I do want to make my appreciation known to them because the, the district does not run without the staff. Uh, the teachers can't teach without the assistance we have from the administration and the staff, the, the front office. Like you said, the, it's the first person, you know, you walk into the school and that's the smile they're receiving uh, when they come to the front office or they see the nurse or, um, you know, it's someone, a welcoming face and, and someone that uh, 
cares that those students are there that day, in addition to their teachers. And the, it's, again, we're at a, at a money shortage. We are having uh, the, we don't get increases every year that uh, go along with the increase of uh, minimum wage. And so we're constantly trying to play catch up uh, for salaries for these people. And the, I want people to feel valued and feel like being, working at Paradise Valley Unified School District is the best place they can be. Uh, and what we can do to make them feel valued and make them feel a part of the team. Uh, I, I think that's what we can, can do to help right now. Thank you so much. Uh, that means that, uh, Tony, you're next. What can we do to support uh, classified staff members and keep them retained? Yes, thank you. Well, some of the same things I'm gonna say for them, I already said about supporting and getting teachers. Um, it's about the pay, about treating like, a, like an equal. So they feel empowered and feel like an equal with the uh, certified staff. Uh, they have a, their own bargaining unit that should be supported and listened to and, and really um, uh, brought in as an equal partner when it comes to any discussion about anything that happens in the district. They need that kind of support as well. Treated like professionals, treated like an equal with every other person in the staff. Um, but again, it goes to funding. If we had enough funding for the benefits and salary they deserve, I don't think we'd lose so many of them. I believe if we make sure that they had a strong bargaining agreement that they keep in place, again, it'd be a recruitment. Look at all the things that you know are going to happen consistently. You don't have to worry about day to day about a change in uh uh, a work ethic or, 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 or a rules that you're, you're working by. There'd be a nice controlled environment, a place that they, and a lot of these people live in the district, okay? So they want their students to have a, a great uh, uh, school experience themselves, okay? So um, that's a great way to pull them in and keep them there, treat them like equals. And uh, like with teachers, try and get more, more pay for them and, and less, less duties. And the duties they do actually have some meaning, not busy work. Great, thank you for that, Tony. Uh, that'll uh, take us to Carrie. Go ahead, same question to you. I mean, our schools don't run without our support staff from the front office to the library, to the nursing office, to crossing guards, to um, special ed. We need to do everything we can. And unfortunately, their pay is really tragically low, especially in this economy. And I mean, short of increasing their pay to keep up with the cost of living, which I know is, is not reasonable with our budgets, um, like the other candidates said, we need to really make them feel valued and appreciated. And like, they are a member of the team. And I know UPC does some great stuff at the end of the year to um, award them and recognize them. And I, if we can just keep up that kind of support and value, I mean, maybe we can attract the kind of staff we need to keep our schools running and safe. I mean, we need them at the crosswalk. We need them at the nurse's office. So um, yeah, just making them feel like a valuable member of the team and that they're not just there to do teachers busy work or run errands or whatever, that what they do really matters. And to truly let them know that any chance we can get. So I guess, I guess that's what I would do. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Sorry about my dogs. Um, you might hear them in the background. Uh, so the same question to you, Rick. Uh, how do we keep our classified staff these days? My, my, my wife and I uh, went out to dinner about a week or so ago. And we uh, came across some big signs at a, a panda bear. And it said, and, um, and uh, the uh, sign said that, um, uh, starting salary for a manager is $68,000, and uh, for a server, someone to serve rice, was close to $40,000. So uh, uh, it is no wonder that when we post positions, we don't get applications for months and months and months. Uh, because of those uh, salary difficulties, it's going, you know, it's very, very, it's, it's just a tough financial situation. But one thing that you can do is you can go out uh, as a board member and you can go out and you can actually go and you can meet with some of these staff people and you can see how they're doing. 
and you can hold sessions with them and you can talk to them and you can be an airing for their complaint and you can try and address those complaints. When I was the chief deputy at the office of the attorney general, I made it a regular routine to make sure that I went out into the offices of individual lawyers to hear uh, what they thought about the office, what things that we could do to improve their lives. So I would reach out to classified staff on an individual basis as a board member in order to assure them that they had our support and that we were listening to them. Great, thank you so much. I, I, I One of my favorite questions, I'm just gonna have to, I think, I don't know, I think I'm gonna, I, I wanna ask it because our members are very engaged at what happens at the legislative level. And so if we go over a little bit on time, I apologize, but I do think that this is a really important question. Um, so this past legislative session, we saw a number of education and school focused bills become law. I mean, whether it had to do with CRT or um, book bannings and, and things like that, uh, we saw a whole bunch. And so I feel like our members deserve an answer to this question. What bill this last legislative session in 2022 gave you the most concern and how will you handle its implementation as a board member? So that means we are going to start with Tony. What legislative uh, bill during 2022 did you see that gave you concern and how do you plan to you know, handle its implementation as a board member, Tony? Wow, that's a really hard question because there's so many that were so, that were so terrible. Uh, the, the transgender banning of sports, the, um, well, the, I guess the worst one is really the, the voucher expansion. Um, hopefully something's done about getting rid of that. Monies that are being pulled away from our schools and our district to go to wherever, wherever you go, with no really no accountability. 60% of Arizonans already said before they didn't want this kind of thing, yet the legislature did it anyway. Um, but I guess I'll stick with the, uh, the one about our transgender students being banned from what activities. Well, they're in our schools, they're in our district. We have to do something for them. Okay, we have to look at the law and find, well, what can we do with these students so they can experience the same things everybody else gets to experience without violating state law? That would probably be one thing I would really look into. How can we find a way to let them know that we want them here, that we love them like we love all our students? and that uh, we're gonna make something happen for them if it's at all possible. I think that's the one I'm gonna address at that time. Okay? Great. Thank you. No, thank you, Tony. Um, so Carrie, now we're gonna go back to you. The same question to you, what bill caused you concern and how would you handle its implementation as a board member? Oh, so this was really hard for me to narrow down. There are, oh, I mean, there's a, lot that really caused me concern. There are four that uh, were at the top of my list. Of course, um, the voucher expansion. I mean, I it's taking money from our already underfunded public schools. And we all know just how terrible that is for public education. But I'm going to go a different direction because we we talk about that one a lot. And I'm out there um, collecting signatures and stuff for that. So I'm going to go. Oh, so HB 2161 is uh, agency and privacy. It violates and robs students of their privacy. It's kind of designed to out LGBTQ students, which um, can cause them really a lot of harm at school and at home and in their community. Sometimes the only person that they feel safe coming out to is a trusted adult at the school, a teacher, a counselor. And if that teacher or counselor under law has to violate that trust and that privacy. I mean, that is so damaging to the student, to the teacher, to the trust that student has with the teacher. And so as a board member, I would go back to, I mean, without violating laws, really trying to enact policy that protects our LGBTQIA plus population because they are our most vulnerable population in our schools and in our communities they're marginalized, their suicide rate is alarmingly high. And so um, that, that one causes me a lot of concern and that's what I would do as a board member. Thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, Rick, we're gonna go to you next, same question. 
Well, the bill, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, well the, the piece of uh, legislation that gives me the greatest heartburn is clearly the, uh, the, uh, the system of uh, universal vouchers. And the reason that I say that is that if that program uh, goes into effect, um, uh, public education as we know it is in serious jeopardy. Um, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned in my opening remarks that uh, public education for generations has been known as the means by which every single one of our children, no matter what their background might be, would have an opportunity to excel, to get out of poverty, to achieve, to be productive uh, citizens. But it also has a unifying force in that we learn about one another by all going to school together. We learn a common history. We learn a common literature. We learn common values of our country. And if we um, uh, take these vast amount of monies and we start giving it to private education, it's, it's going to take huge amounts of money out of public schools and it's going to have this reverberating effect where schools are going to, public schools are going to be weakened and the more they are weakened, more and more parents are going to be taking their kids out of school and, and it's going to have a snowball effect. And I can assure you that uh, uh, public education as we know it in this state is going to cease to exist. So as a board member, uh, as a citizen, we need to do everything that we can to fight it and make sure that this gets rescinded. Great, thank you so much. And then finally, that's going to take us to Susan, the most concerning bill that you saw go through our legislature this election cycle. Um, I definitely have the same concerns with the, uh, the expanded ESA programs. Uh, and I definitely think it's something that the taxpayers need a, a chance to vote on once again and let their feelings heard on this uh, because it does take money uh, without consent and, and putting, putting it in uh, taxpayer money, putting it in places where the taxpayers no longer have any say in, in those funds. Whereas right now in the, when it's in the public school districts, they can come and speak at board meetings and they can have a say in, uh, in what's going on in public education. And once it's removed from that, they, there is no uh, board meeting they can go to at a private school to demand accountability. That, that's just gone. Um, I, another one that I had concerns on, and it's something we are going to need to be implementing, and we are in a better position than many school districts across the state, is the, um, the library bill, um, HB 2439. Uh, where the, uh, you know, every single book, anytime it's purchased it and needs to be on the website for 60 days and, and uh, everything needs to be searchable in a certain way. Uh, we are lucky that we already have systems that uh, are, the books are online, but it's going to be a whole new set of processes. It's going to be a whole new training system for our staff members who are working in the libraries and updating websites across every single school. Um, it's a lot of work, and I think that what we need to keep reminding legislators is that uh, that adding additional uh, regulations and laws on things that most times are already available and out there for people who are asking, uh, but putting laws into place that adds extra work uh, to school districts means time, it means money, it means staff, and, and we are short on all of those things. And, and so to, uh, to try to comply with laws uh, that most, in most cases, those were already things happening uh, or that, it, that people had access to, uh, but to put it in place now and have to comply very specifically with laws, it, it takes time and, and money and we need to be aware of that. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for indulging me. But again, I know that that's important to our members, so I wanted to get to it. I'm so grateful for all of you for being here. And speaking of banned books, I want to just go ahead and point out again that we do have this really great I Read Banned Books shirt for sale. Uh, it helps us to be able to have these kinds of candidate forums to pay our staff to advocate at the Capitol. And so with all of that, and I've already told you about the events tonight, if you don't know about them, 
we will share a link uh, both uh, here and on our Facebook page, but I'm going to let you all close it out so that you can get back to your families and that everybody else can go watch and binge their favorite shows. So uh, it looks to me, oh, look, it, it looks like we're going to go ahead and start with Carrie again. So um, close us out. Talk about why you should be elected for this uh, two-year seat, Carrie. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I should be elected because I have um, the teaching experience. I've been in the classroom. Um, not only have I been in the classroom myself, I was raised in a classroom. I come from uh, two teachers. My mom taught eighth grade uh, science for 30 plus years and my dad taught first grade for 35 plus years. So um, I have a lot of experience in what teachers go through and what uh, support teachers need. I also uh, have four kids in the district. I mean, I have a lot vested in this. My youngest is just going into first grade. So everything that happens at the school board affects my kids for years and years to come. And um, as a parent, I come with a lot of experience. My oldest child is 22 and my youngest is six. I've been through it all. I have gifted kids. I have, my daughter has autism. I have a trans child in the schools. And so I just really feel that I bring a lot to the table, a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. And um, that's why I think I uh, should have a spot in the two-year seat on the governing board. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carrie. Rick, same question to you. Why should the voters in Paradise Valley Unified School District vote for you for this two-year seat? I have a very, very long uh, history in, uh, in this community. I've lived in the Paradise Valley School District for some 44 years. Um, uh, I was in private practice. I was a highly respected lawyer. And as a matter of fact, uh, in one of the uh, uh, largest education cases, to ever hit the state of Arizona, I was the lead lawyer on that case, and uh, and uh, uh, it was called State v. Flores, and I had three trials, two trips to the Ninth Circuit, and one trip to the United States Supreme Court, and ultimately the position of the Department of Education was vindicated. I've been on the Paradise Valley Unified School District Board at a very in a very very tumultuous uh, time, and it was a period of a uh, time when. Um, we were able to significantly raise the teacher uh, salaries. We raised standards of excellence. We lowered class sizes, and we elevated the respect for our school district. I've had I've been the president of a synagogue, and if you don't think things uh, uh, can, uh, can be uh, contentious in other arenas, trust me. One of the uh, best things you can say about being the president of a synagogue is that you are the ex-president of a synagogue. Um, I was on the executive committee of the Anti-Defamation League. Um, I was chief deputy of the attorney general's office and I was chairman of something called the Board of the Southwest Border Alliance, um, in which there were tremendous contentions among all the various border states. And as the chairman of the board, I brought uh, 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 a resolution to a lot of conflict uh, among the uh, states. So I will be a strong independent voice, but I will also be a conciliatory voice. Uh, I know how to bring people together. I know how to listen, and I know how to bring rational solutions to problems. If there is a issue, I throw myself into it, I learn about it, I study it, and I, and I think I know how to come up with reasonable solutions. And finally, I will focus on excellence in education. Um, I will focus on academics, and I'll be shining a light uh, on every aspect of academics so that every single one of the kids in our school district has a reasonable solid opportunity to advance and become a functioning literate citizen when they graduate from high school. Great, thank you so much, Rick. Uh, and that means that we have Susan next. Go ahead and close this out. Why should people in Paradise Valley Unified School District vote for you for one of the four-year seats? Um, I would love to earn the voter support. I uh, My goals are to support students and educators through collaboration. I think it's so important what we do in our district and, um, and making sure that all voices are heard. And I, and I want that to continue and be in the forefront of the district. Um, I think it's really important that we keep a strong board uh, and maintain um, stability in the district. I think that uh, 
that is something that will retain teachers actually is a, a strong board that is supporting teachers and uh, supporting our, our district. Um, I want to continue to focus on every single student, every learner in, in our district uh, deserves our support, deserves to be given the tools that each one needs to succeed. And that's different for everyone. And we need to take the time uh, and spend the time uh, giving every learner what they need to succeed. Uh, I'm also very, um, I, I wanna focus on positive and effective communication with all of our stakeholders. I think having um, speaking positively about our district and within our district and with our stakeholders is a huge part of keeping the district strong. Uh, I'm very passionate about our district. I would love to continue to support Paradise Valley Unified School District and uh, the entire district, all the taxpayers, all of the stakeholders across the board. I'd love to continue uh, to represent you uh, in the capacity as a school board member, a governing board member for Paradise Valley Unified School District. Again, I'm Susan Matura. You can find more about, uh, learn more about me at electsusanmatura.com. And uh, thank you for tuning in and learning about us. Thank Great. you for thank hosting you. us. Of course, no, it's my pleasure. Uh, again, my, my, my true um, professional highlight in my educational career has been serving on my school board. So I, I can't say enough to all of you. Thank you for deciding to run and especially in such a tumultuous time where we're facing so many things. And, and by the way, if the rest of you would like to go ahead and put your links into the chat, we'll do our best to post it on Facebook, but I wanna to give Tony a chance to close us out and tell us why you should be elected for that four-year position, Tony. Well, my whole life, whole life has it been in public education one way or another. My father was a, a counselor and then an administrator for Scottsdale Unified School District. My brother taught in Mesa. Okay, before he retired, my the, the mother of my children was a teacher here in PV school district. I've been here living here for 43 years, teaching here for 43 years. I know the old history of the district, like when I was on a bargaining team to get us uh, a big raise back in the time um, uh, Mr. Bistro was talking about. But I'm also uh, know the current history. I know all the people and, and policies of the district currently. Uh, I've got a passion for this learning and for making sure our students have the same experience my children had. Um, I'm retired. This is my only focus is to work hard to make sure this district stays at those high levels we believe in. You know, our, our motto is, um, what's the saying? Our mission, just uh, cultivate world-class thinkers. We can't have world-class thinkers unless they know about the world. Let's bring them the world. As Tony for PV Schools, and I've got a Facebook page. Um, if I get if I remember it, I'll put the link uh, from my web page. Anyway, thank you for your time on this. I appreciate it. Sure. And you can go back and find these links. We will have them posted to our Facebook page. We will also have them on our YouTube page. And you, of course, are all welcome to share them. Uh, I see that Carrie has put in her Venmo. So, you know, I know it's tough <laughs> out there in, during a, an election cycle when there are so many candidates at so many levels. So uh, we're really, again, we are not uh, endorsing any candidates here. We're just <laughs> pleased to be able to share your vision with the folks in your community because the work that you all want to do is so very important. And it's clear to me with the five of you that you bring, or the four of you, I'm sorry, I, I'm an English teacher, not a math teacher, but you bring <laughs> so much experience and knowledge to this position and so much diversity as well. So I just want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedules. Thank you to the attendees. I went ahead on Facebook and I posted our events, but we will have another candidate forum. Next one is going to be Kyrene. After that, we've scheduled Marana because we want to make sure that we're not just Maricopa County centric. So I appreciate everybody for taking time out of their very busy schedules to share your vision, to attend, to share this with your neighbors and people who are in um, you know, your district. So thanks everybody on this Wednesday night and I hope you have a really wonderful rest of your week. So take care, thank you.